So today what we're going to take a look at is the um, website hackthissite.org and this is a website that has been set up for a very long time. As you can see it's been active since 2003 according to their own info and that's a very long time. Consequently a lot of the activities we're going to see today are very dated but that's fine. This is about thinking how hackers think, looking at what you discover and trying to realize some vulnerabilities about it and it's a really good introduction. And to that end, I'm going to have a couple of recommended steps that you can try when you're hacking a website. Of course, this is not a guarantee. There are no guarantees. There's no iterating through a list of steps that will guarantee you will be able to hack any or every website. But it's a good way to start. It's a good way of organizing your attack. All right. First off, get permission. We've mentioned this before when we were discussing ethics get written, express, explicit permission to actually engage in this kind of activity against that site. Often the way to mitigate this is just to grab a copy of the virtual machine files, bring them into your test environment, and attack them. And that's what we're going to do this semester. Regardless though, don't just go hacking websites that you don't have permission to attack. If you want to attack sites like Facebook, um, like Twitter, and stuff like that, often what you can do is enroll in a what's called a, um, a bug bounty campaign where you can actually get access to test versions of their websites and if you discover anything you might actually get paid. But those are set up specifically to be attacked and once you enter into this bug bounty campaign you have been given permission to attack that site. And it's been pretty clear what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do in the uh, rules or the policies of that, um, that testing environment. So regardless, always get permission. Next thing you want to do is take a look at the source code. You'd be surprised at what things are hidden in the source code that you might be able to use as part of your attack. All right. Next thing, it just comes with trying stuff. When it comes to websites, submit empty forms, try throwing some bad data in there, see if you can generate some errors, and then finally try and do some kind of an injection. Mostly it's SQL injections, but they could be command injections, they could be uh, JavaScript or um, yeah, embedded JavaScript, so you can do cross-site scripting, um, those kinds of things. But just try doing some injections based on what you see. And it's all about you try something, you see what you get, and then you pivot on those results. Try, analyze the results, pivot. Try, analyze, pivot. Try, analyze, pivot. That's what hacking is. All of these hacks are going to take a few minutes each. In the real world, hacks can take weeks or maybe even months or more because the technical mitigations are that good. Consequently, along all of this, you should probably doing some. You should probably be doing some very detailed note taking, and report writing, and we will be doing that this semester as well. Any questions? All right, so let's start. The first one we're going to look at. Oh, sorry. Let's get to our missions. So once you're logged in, you will see a list of challenges along the side. And you can see there are different categories of challenges. We're going to focus on the basic missions, of which there are 11. We're only going to do the first 10. After you have them completed, you will see that you've already completed this mission. And once you do the mission, you don't get any extra points. There's a point system here because everything's gamified. Of course it is. All right. So the first one is pretty straightforward. As I said in our instructions, we can assume that we have permissions to hack this site. And in case you're curious, when you take a look at the realistic missions and you take a look at the last realistic mission, expressly they say, hey, try and hack this site. Try and take this site online, uh, offline or find out anything you can about this site. Um, um, I show you that because it speaks to what I was saying before about getting permission. They have given us permission to attack their site, but more importantly, it also, um, sometimes this site goes offline while we're doing this lecture. It's always come back, but because this site is always under attack, 
at some point we may have to take a five minute break and come back and hope the site is back up and running because it is literally under attack all the time all right so let's get to it the first one is called the idiot test we have permission the next thing on our document is to take a look at the source code if you're using um, Firefox control you will show you the source code and as always and this is you don't you should check the entirety of the document you really should but by and large again to try and streamline this process it's always going to be around well, today it's around line 150, but it's going to be around lines 140, lines 150 in that area. Okay? What we're looking for is something like level, and then you're going to see a block of text that's going to look something like this. All right? So somewhere around line 140, 150, that's where we're going to focus our source code research. And in this case, we've got a comment comments are great. Hidden form elements are always great. Anything that you're hiding from the user in the browser is worth investigating. And right here we see something pretty interesting. Your password string is going to be different than my password string because one of the things about this, it's not a literal web page that you're hacking. These are all you know generated on the fly and the password strings are often based on your user ID and will often be different than mine because they're based on my user ID. All right. So in this case I got a password string that looks like that. Highlight the password string, copy it, go back, try that password and submit. Do not update your password. I recommend against updating your password in your password manager. Okay? Just click away. And you should get the, you know, Uber speak congrats. Did everybody get that? Are there any questions or problems? Congratulations. You are now a hacker. You can go to a bar when they open up again and look down your nose at all the low life around you because apparently being a hacker requires being incredibly egotistical. All right, next challenge. So next one is, all right, so Sam realized his mistake. And there's an overall story arc to these activities where you're trying to battle, for whatever reason, network security Sam, who doesn't seem to be very good at setting up password management in his applications. So this one, as security Sam realized his mistake and is now fixing his um, problem. Okay? There might be a problem. And we're always looking for clues. And you often get some clues in the description of what's going on here. So not only do you want to take a look at the source code around line 140 to 150, there's our form right there. For me, it's line 152 to 159 or thereabouts. I don't really see anything here, okay? We don't find any clues here, no hidden fields, no commented code. And also, I want to take a look at what's going on in the web page itself. Um, he, a real password in an unencrypted file, but he neglected to upload the password file. So there's some clues going on here as well which is interesting. So what we might try and do is we've, we've taken a look at the source code. The next thing we want to try in our list is just submit an empty form and see what that gives us. We're looking for any clues. Hopefully it'll throw an error saying, hey, you're supposed to submit something. Unfortunately this time, um, it actually worked. It actually let us log in. Now, those were the first two missions. Did they seem real world to you? And I'm actually asking you, do those two seem real world? It can happen, and that's the better answer, yes. First of all, as always, we are reluctant to speak in absolutes, but your answers are correct. Yeah, they are a little, I don't know. But these are the real world scenarios that can happen. First off, when you're involved in a group development project, one of the ways that you store credential information for others in the group to test is in the source code. It has happened, and it has happened where those credentials have been pushed to the wild as part of a release. So that has happened where people have stored their credentials in the, in the source code as commented um, HTML text. 
doesn't happen often, it doesn't usually stay long in the wild, but it has happened. As to the failed login that let me log in, that's actually happened to me one of the times I was developing something. I updated some libraries that I was using and it actually broke my login script and I didn't realize that a user pointed it out to me. So you don't, you know, fail to upload the password file, but sometimes something can happen in your stack that breaks your login credentials. So they are rare and they just go to show that you really do need to have a proper review process when you're pushing your stuff to the world. Alrighty? Any questions on either of those? Alrighty, let's take a look at challenge three. Again, we have permissions. The next thing on we want to do on our list is take a look at the source code. Control U, scroll down to around line 140 to 150. Um, again, we have a hidden file, all right? And anything hidden, not a hidden file, so we have a hidden form element. And any hidden form elements, something we want to take a look at. In this case, it's called file, and there's something that actually looks like a file name without any directory structure as well. That might actually be worth taking a look at, okay? So I've got this thing called password.php, Let's take a look at that. It seems to be in the same directory we're in. So let's take a look at password.php. And look at that. We've got a string. Looks suspiciously like an unhashed password, randomly generated. Highlight copy, hit the back button, paste that, and see if it works. And of course it does. Now that one... Uh, it's a little too contrived for my liking, but what it points to again is the process that you should probably go through. Look for clues, try stuff. You might not get anything. Most times you try stuff and you get what is expected back of you, but you look through everything and you try stuff. I keep focusing you to around lines 140 to 160 in the source code. If this was a real attack, you would look at everything in the source code looking for clues, looking for things that you can try and probe and see if you can't trick or manipulate it to do something unexpected. Already, any questions on that? Did everybody get that? Let's move on. Got it, thank you. All right, so remember how I said um, you really need a real email address that you can check for today's activities? This is why, because now what we're going to do is we're going to try and exploit um, something that Sam set up. Sam has hardcoded the, um, the password into the script. Sam is an old guy like me and he doesn't remember stuff, so he set up an email reminder system so that he can send the email to himself. Mission four and mission five can be solved the exact same way. They are supposed to re represent two different challenges, but please keep in mind that Mission 4 and Mission 5 can both be solved with the solution that we're going to look at next. However, I want to talk about them in different ways of solving it so that we can talk about some of the mitigations that you should keep in mind when you're doing this kind of development. Okay, so first things first, control U, see what we get. Scroll down, see if we can find any clues. And right away, we again have a hidden value called setting this to an email address, all right? And then we can click on submit to send that to Sam. So we've got this form right here, which calls this script and passes to that script an email address. That is very, very suspicious. I'm gonna highlight that block of text I'm going to copy it and then I'm going to open up my preferred text editor. For me, it is my Ultra Edit text editor. So now I've got that code here. All right, a little bit of cleanup, make it a little easier to read. Boom. All right. So now I've captured that basic form. Before we do that, though, Let's test it. Remember, we want to just try empty form data, and we just want to submit it with dummy data. And as we expected, a password reminder was successfully sent. I should have done that first, 
Um, you should always be testing that. But I had the source code, so I highlighted and grabbed the source code. Regardless, um, view the source. After you've tested it, view the source and take a look at that block of code that was used to send the password. Everything from form to end form that has that submit button that sends the password to Sam. Highlight that, copy it, put it in your preferred text editor, and what we want to do is we want to save a local copy of that. File, save as, I'm going to save it in my shirt. Sure, we'll save it there and I'll call it email dot html because it is an html file at this point all right and what i'm hoping to do is to execute that script and i'm hoping to send it to me so i need to make a couple of changes first off this action will not work all right the action you need to use is the action based on this website here all right so select the URL because that's where this script exists missions basic four all right so paste that and clean it up all right so that we're not just calling a file but we're fully qualifying the domain and path to that script to execute so we're calling hack the site dot org missions basic four level 4.php you are logged in and you do need the https the, the tls or ssl protocol on this one okay that's the first edit if we're going to call this script we have to fully qualify it including the domain and the protocol where to find it all right also we need to specify a different email address to send it to and that email address has to match the email address you have when you registered. Right? For me, it's my Gmail account. The reason why I'm using my Gmail account and not my MTS account like I have in my lecture notes is that my MTS is just too slow these days. I use the uh, web mail portal and it's just stupid slow, so I'm going to use my Gmail account. It doesn't matter what you use as long as it matches what you have configured in your profile. So specify that, again save that, and now you want to load it in your browser. Okay. So now when I click on send the password to Sam, it should say that the email was sent to the email that you specify and it called in that perfectly. Go to your Gmail or whatever email you are using and it is possible that you're going to see some spam perfect it has sent the password to me and the password is right here All right. highlight that password copy it go back into where you were working before try it paste it and submit and it should work I like this one for a couple of reasons, okay? But before we do that, let's revisit exactly what we did. The first thing I did was I realized that when I click on the send it to Sam, it sends out an email. We saw that in the source code as well. I grabbed the source code that sent that email and I modified it. I sent it to myself and I fully qualified the path so that I could redirect that password to myself. Now it is a bit contrived in that I had to send it to the or set it to the exact email I used when I registered for this site or that I updated after I registered, which is what I did here. I've updated the email since I created that account, which is why they're out of sync from the lecture notes. Once I did that, I sent the email to myself and when I reviewed it, there it is there. I then go back, try that password and of course it works. Any questions? All right. The reason why I like this is that it shows the multifaceted nature of hacking. It's not just, oh, look, there it is, or look, there it is. Okay, I found something, now let's try something. 
so I have to take what I found, bring it somewhere else, and try something else with it. In this case, creating a new form, modifying the form so I could send it to something else other than what the form expected, and now I've got the um, password sent to me. Now, do you think that's realistic? Yes. And the example I like to use is beginning developers or beginner developers who've never actually properly learned how to do these things. If you're stuck with code and you do a search, where do you invariably end up first on the list? Anybody? Well, Google. When you start Googling, where do you end up? What's the domain? What's the website you usually end up when you're looking for source code, code problems? It's exactly the answer I was looking for. Thank you. Stack Overflow. So when you go to Stack Overflow and um, you start looking for solutions, you might come across someone that says, hey, you're looking to develop a login script. I've got the perfect login script for you. Here you go. It's a turnkey solution. By the way, do me a favor. Please keep my name in the source code so I know who's using my code. Right? Of course they want you because they're out there looking for any new entries in a Google search for their name. They find their source code in your website and then they use it and then they realize that they have introduced vulnerabilities or some kind of backdoor that they can then take advantage of on your site. And that's what you see happening. And often there's an aspect to it where they get other accounts or friends or whatever to upvote their answer so it becomes the top result. We see this time and time again. Um, also, if you don't think about it too much, the fact that the source code would actually have the email address so you can more quickly deploy it might actually be an honest mistake by somebody on um, Stack Overflow who doesn't think of security, who thinks of solving the problem more than thinking all the way through to the security side. And that's what I want you to do. Think critically of security all the time. What's the easiest way to create a solution so that anybody can deploy it anywhere in the world? We'll have a simple mail to script and accept a hidden form element as an argument. And that's problematic and we'll see that in the next slide. Any questions? The next mission I should say. Alrighty, let's move on. Now, I did that because another problem with this activity is that this script allows someone outside of the domain to call it. And you can configure your server to not allow that to happen. You can also configure your scripts to check the referring agent to make sure that it is being called from your domain. All right which is kind of what happens with Mission 5. When Mission 5, uh, when Security Sam came along and did Mission 5, he made sure that the script is going to be called from within the domain so that we cannot do this remote exploit. But we can still take advantage of this because it's still the basically the same script. This time we can go and inspect the element. And this is why we're using Firefox. You can right click on the button and select inspect element. And that will bring up the form that we have. And just like we saw with my PayPal example earlier this week, we can go in and manipulate elements in the DOM by simply selecting the to value, changing that from the email that's already there, sam at hackthesite.org, to the email you have in your configuration. So for me, it's Stephen J at Gmail. All right, you can hit enter. You can click away. Either one will temporarily set it for now. Go back, click on send the password, and it'll say that it has been sent to that email address. And then you can go in, go back to your inbox, and you will see a new password sent. All right. The more recent one is the one, of course, that you want to take a look at. Alrighty. Again, highlight that, copy it, go back, go back, try that password, and submit. And of course, it works. All right. I like these two because they show the weaknesses of a beginner who's found a solution online, and it may have been, you know. Um, 
maliciously developed, or it may have been an innocent mistake on whoever supplied that code to them, where it's just like, here, here's a code, try that. And um, by the way, just change this hidden form element. And, that, and that's why you never trust anything from the browser. Validate everything on the server before you start manipulating or using that data. All right. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? Do you think these are real world? Yeah, they are. They're the first ones, especially Mission 5 is probably the first very real world example. And again, it goes back to the um, Stack Overflow uh, type of uh, issue where somebody who doesn't know what they're doing Googles for a solution ends up on Stack Overflow, which I'm not trying to crap all over Stack Overflow. I think it's actually, in theory, a really good resource. It's a tends, tries to be a good site. Unfortunately, people out there will find vulnerabilities in systems. People found vulnerabilities in Stack and took advantage of them. Alrighty. Are there any questions? Let's move on to Mission 6. All right. Mission six gets into encryption, all right? But first, let's go through our process. So we have permissions, control U to take a look at the source code. We're gonna scroll down to around lines 140 to 150 to 160. We go through, don't really see anything here and nothing new that we don't already see when we take a look at the source code or the page. We have an indication that there is an encrypted password, but we also know what tool Sam used to encrypt that. So oh, we're having network issues. If I get broken up or you lose my signal, let me know and I'll repeat. All right. So um, we have the encryption tool that Security Sam used to come up with this encrypted hash. We have somehow managed to capture the encrypted hash and that can happen a number of different ways. But now that we have it, what are we going to do with it? We're going to try and crack that password. First thing we can try and do is submit empty form data. We don't get anything here. Now we can try entering some gibberish and see what we get. I recommend typing in eight characters. We have eight characters here. Let's submit eight A's, for example. You can submit whatever you want, but I want you to understand the before and after. When I typed in eight A's, I got A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. So what does that mean? Well, let's take a look. If I typed in A, 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 and I get A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, you can quickly understand exactly what the offset was. It was zero, one, two, three, volume, I cannot type today, four, five, six, and seven. Any character that you type in is going to be offset by that order, okay? And we will see this when we take a look at encryption. It's a, I can't remember the name of it, but this is right out of the one of the early examples of encryption. Um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but it's it's uh, it's not the earliest type of encryption that we've seen. That is probably a side tale, but it is um, tabula recta, I think, is what it's called. But I'm drawing a blank on the name. Anyway, a very simple offset that we see here. Terrible. <laughs> yeah, the very worst. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, so knowing this, all right, also knowing what the resulting hash was, we can take that. If I know that's my hash and I know this is the offset, I should be able to reverse that information. Now it gets a little tricky. Like what's one, what's zero characters less than B? And again, this is my string your string is going to be different so you're going to have to work through this on your own and I'll give you I'll give you a while to work on it okay so this is my character if I offset it by zero it's still going to be B but what's one less than a full colon well that's one of the things that I have in today's lecture note 
If you go to the very end of the document, and this is just one example, you can also go online and you can find your own ASCII table. All right? You can use this ASCII table to count back your characters. For example, right here, and I don't know how to highlight on this, but right underneath my mouse right here, I have the full colon. One character less than the full character is the number nine. Well, let's try that. All right, seven, two less than seven is five. G, three less than G is probably E, right? E, F, G, no, D, E, F, G. So I'm going to say it's D. And if I'm not sure, I have G here, one, two, three. It is D, perfect. Four less than four is zero. Five less than six is one. Six less than L. It's too early in the day for me to figure that out. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to say that's an F. And seven less than the less than symbol. I have the less than symbol right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to say it's um, five. But let's say I miscounted. Let's say it's four. Okay. One of the beauties of this is that we can test our work again. This is the hash. It's not really, it, it's supposed to be a one-way. A hash is supposed to be a one-way encryption process. We'll talk about this later. This is because there's no algorithm that ensures one-way encryption. It's technically not a hash. It's just simply encrypted text within one of the most basic encryptions that are out there. But this is our decrypted text here. But we still have the tool used so we can still test it. So we can copy our resulting string, go back and test that again and see what it tells us. We can take that resulting string and see if it matches. Highlight that, go back here and compare the two. It's very close, but we can see that one character is off. So again, I can go check my ASCII table, but a little bit more research tells me that it probably should be a five and not a four or six or whatever it is I had there. So we go back, try again. Highlight the text. Compare our results. It matches. Perfect. We know this string is now the right string. Have to highlight it again because you copied the resulting encrypted string. I can now go. I can now go back and try that, and see what I get. And of course, it works. Any questions on that? I'm going to give you some time to work on it. Um, you can't really progress past this point until you crack that password. And some people really struggle with that. If you're really struggling, I'm happy to help you in about 10 minutes, but I want you to figure this out on your own, okay? Because this is weak hacking, but this is exactly the kind of thing that you have to do. You found something, you need to crack it. Let's figure out how we can crack it. You can't move past that point until you crack it, so go ahead and try and crack it, all right? Now, and, and in case you think that that isn't uh, a very good encryption, tabula recta. That is called the tabula recta. I was right, I should have trusted myself. There it is right there. The standard offset, it's called the tabula recta. It's an old encryption. It is far from reliable, but it's easy to test against. And in case you think that's the only example of bad encryption, you can also take a look at something called ROT13. Vion. ROT13. Which is basically a 13 character offset. It's called ROT13. It's used for quickly hiding text so people can't figure it out but it's a well-known, and there's actually literally tools online for encrypting and decrypting uh, strings using ROT13. So they do exist in the wild. It is a little contrived. Of course, you should use much better encryption, and the encryption that you use should not generate encrypted text. It should generate what are called hashes, which cannot be decrypted. 
We'll talk about this again when we do our logins in a couple of weeks. But at the end of the day, when you encrypt a string, there should be no path back to decryption. So you say, well, how do I log in then? What you do is you repeat the encryption process with the supplied string. If the resulting hash is the exact same as the hash you've stored in your database, then the original strings must match. We'll see that when we do our logins in a little while, but that's the whole point. You do a one-way encryption, and the only way you can confirm is by comparing the resulting regenerated hash using the exact same process. If the hashes are the same and the processes are the same, the original strings must therefore be the same as well. Any questions? Okay, take 10 minutes, try and figure this out. Some of you will be done instantly, some of you will be stuck. Um, we'll pick this up again at nine o'clock. Um, if you need, go grab some coffee. I'm gonna try and grab some coffee. If you need some help, I'm willing to help, but try and figure it out on your own. Take your hash, reverse it, and then test the resulting strings to make sure that they match the hashes again. And it's not a hash, but I, for whatever reason, can't let go of that term. So go ahead, try it. Let me know if it's working for you or not. If not, um, ask for some help, but at least try for 10 minutes first. All right? Okay. I will uh, stop now. We'll pick this up at 9 o'clock. I'm going to resume my desktop capture, and I'm going to start a new recording in Teams. So we are recording again in Teams. I believe we are anyway. There we go. Okay, so we're recording again in Teams, and uh, I'm again capturing this on my desktop capture software. So, as I said, uh, Mission 6 was a pretty uh, simplistic encryption, but it goes through the process again of trying something and seeing what you get. Trying and seeing what you get. Trying and seeing what you get. The reason why I supplied the number of characters that I did is because that's the number of characters that were in the password string. As I said, it's not a hash, but we've seen examples of this in the past where people try and use clever things. There's a whole group of uh, people who use security through obscurity and hope that's good enough. There's nothing wrong with security through obscurity, but it cannot be the end point of your security plan. It has to be part, again, of a layered approach to security hoping that people wouldn't realize that they were using this simple tabula recta uh, encryption design wasn't good enough because we tried something we realized what they were using for their encryption process and it was very easy for us to reverse it and that's what you need to keep in mind going forward any questions on that at this point already let's move on I like chapter, uh, example seven. Um, this used to be a problem in the early days of uh, server-side web development back in, like, back in the 90s, early thousands kind of thing. When we first were developing, and I was doing web development back then, so I can relate 100% to this. Back in the day, we didn't um, really think through the consequences of us screwing around. So we used to do things like this all the time. We would make a web page and we'd say, hey, do you want to see today's dates? Hey, do you want to see this calendars for this month? Because we knew there were commands that did this, so we just added them to our website. One of the things you can do here, first off, let's go through the protocol, control U, take a look, two form elements, no real clues here. Next thing we want to do is just hit an empty form and we get a calendar that looks suspiciously like the output of the cal command. We also have, and again we're looking for clues, we have a .pl up here. Does anybody know what the extension pl means in the web development word, world? It, no, you are 100% correct. It is a Perl script. PL stands for Perl Scripts. Think Python back in the day. It was a step above Unix shell scripting. It was um, designed by um, a PhD um, 
candidate, I believe he was at the time, uh, for an ink. He was a language. He was an English PhD student at the time, or he was already a. Do he already had his PhD or whatever. But he wanted to develop a scripting environment that allow him to read in, parse, and output huge amounts of text. He came up with Perl, the Practical Extraction Reporting Language, which is a script, a shell scripting environment like a Unix shell, but can handle huge amounts of text quite quickly. It was the perfect environment for the early days of web development, and a lot of websites were developed using Perl. This is the first language that I became very proficient in when I was developing websites back in the day. Um, there were a bunch of libraries that were produced to allow people to develop websites pretty quickly. The most common one being the CGI uh, lib PL, uh, Perl libraries. Um, that's one other thing I wanted to say about Perl. Oh, it's gone. Anyway, um, and it was it ran easily in the Unix world. It was easy to set up and execute scripts. It used the common gateway interface, the CGI, the common gateway interface. Uh, before using Perl, if you wanted dynamic web content, you wrote either a Unix shell script or more likely you wrote a bunch of C code, including the CGI libraries, compiled it, and then you had a standalone executable running in your environment. Think Java websites and JAR files. Kind of the same thing. Um, Perl came along or people started using Perl and gave us a great website, but it allows us to use Unix system calls really easily. So this Perl script is probably calling the cal command. Let's see. If we go back and supply a year, like 2021, it'll give us the calendar output for the year 2021. So it not only does it run the cal command, but more importantly, it seems to accept arguments. And this is risky. We're going to talk about the risk in a second. But allowing a script to accept arguments and then making system calls to the operating system with those arguments can be risky. And the problem is a process called command chaining. Now, you've all taken Linux in your in information systems course back in semester one. Does anybody recall how to execute two Unix commands at one time on one line with one carriage return. Exactly. So if I want to specify a year 2021, I can also use a semicolon and try passing a second command, such as the ls command. If now I want a calendar of that, let's see what happens. It gives me 2021. It also gives me a directory listing. That is called command injection or command chaining. And it was the fourth one or the fifth one, I believe. Yeah, it's the fifth one. We've already done empty form well, permissions. We've done um, review the source, empty form, and gibberish. And now we're trying to do some injections into our form elements. In this case, it's a command injection. And it is a common tool. If you actually get into some of the... Um, hackathons where you actually get into capture the flag type activities this is a very common vehicle for gaining access on some of the earlier more basic level stuff and we'll see these this semester where you actually allow people for whatever reason to execute commands it's not often the cal command it's often the ping command if you see if you're engaged in some kind of a capture the flag activity for pen testing and you see a web page that says hey let's ping a website right away you know you're looking at command chaining right away okay also you don't necessarily need to supply an argument if it's going to run the command all you need to do is to end the previous command and start a new one it executes the previous command and then it starts a new one and what it does is it gives me a directory listing of the directory I am in so this is the directory I'm in these are the files. If we go back and take a look, um, Sam has saved the unencrypted level 7 password in an obscurely named file saved in this very directory. We know that there's this weird file name right here. It seems to be in this directory. We can highlight that file name, change cal.pl into that weirdly named file name. Your file name is likely going to be different than mine. But when we click on that, again, we see an eight-character, 
what looks like a plain text password string. Highlight that, copy it, go back, and go back, and try it, and submit. Any questions on that? Does that seem real world to you? Yes, in the early days when I was first teaching web programming back in the day, I inadvertently did this to my students. I had them do the mail, the send mail Unix command to do a basic mail script. And when I was developing that, one of the students noticed that we could do command injection on that. And it was like gobsmacked. It was one of the first times I realized what hacking was doing out there. So this is very real world. It is such a problem that modern versions of PHP, PHP, I guess we're up to 7 now, actually disable this feature by default. Earlier versions of PHP, you could actually do the, um, I can't remember exactly what the function is, but you could do a system call in PHP and it would probably work. And it is such a huge problem that by default PHP has turned it off and then the docs say don't turn this on because you're opening up huge risks you can mitigate those risks by sanitizing your inputs, but the moment you allow it, you introduce risks to your website and to your infrastructure. It is such a huge problem. All right. Any questions on that? Did everybody get that? Okay. Let's move on. Well, now let's quickly review. Again, what did we do? We realized that this was doing a system call through a Perl script, and we realized that we could do something called command chaining, add two commands together. The commands that I added to the cal command was the ls command. I found the file name, and then I simply copied that file name and added that to the URL in the same directory. And then that gave me a plain text password string copy it and try it and of course it works let's move on to challenge eight okay any questions all right again we can start taking a look at the source code again we can try and you know find some hidden form elements we should probably should because it's a good habit to always have but when we take a look again, we don't get anything extra other than what we see right here in the description. Sam is still going with that obscure password file name. Um, we don't know how to find it, but in our research on this website, it seems that Sam's daughter Stephanie is playing around with PHP. She doesn't know what she's doing, but she's using the corporate website for her um, development which first off people should not be using production environments for building up or developing their skills that's what test developments are that's what um, sandbox environments are used for so that if you do something stupid you don't end up uh, sharing or dumping out um, valuable protected information regardless so let's take a look at what's going on here now the first thing we want to do is to submit an empty form Please excuse me, I was coughing. coughing. And it says, your file has been saved. Wait, what? We're actually writing to the file system now? That's bold. Please click here to view the file. And when I click on it, there's first off the URL. It talks about a directory called temp. Okay, well that's not a bad idea, but that's probably done for directory permissions because generally you don't allow the web server process to write to the web directory you tend to give them write permissions to a specific directory in the overall document root so that you don't introduce vulnerabilities elsewhere. But we've got this file name here that includes an extension .shtml. Is anybody familiar with .shtml files? It's not secure. Go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, it's not secure HTML. It stands for server side includes HTML, SSIs. And um, another thing, it says hi, comma, so there's no name there, and your name contains zero characters. How does it know how many characters it has? So there seems to be some processing going on here, 
and this file called shtml. As I said, shtml stands for server side includes, and it was the first attempt in the Apache world to bring something akin to server side programming in a document. Um, and the example I like to use to really explain the whole point of server side includes and shtml files is let's say back in the day you've got a huge website but it's mostly static content and you've got a document uh, documentation system online for your product line and you've got hundreds of documents out there and it's a complicated navigation structure and it's all statically driven because we didn't have database driven websites back then and you've got a navigation for your whole site and you've got header and footer information for your whole site and it's been a year rollover it's now 2021 as opposed to 2020 and you need to upright, update the copyright information for each one of those pages now you can do a global search and replace but those are always risky what would be better is if you could just embed something called a header and a footer and in all of those documents and then change the content of that footer file and that's what shtml gave us it was a structure in a document that looked an awful lot like a comment but if the file was called dot shtml then apache if it was configured properly would then look through that document and look for ssi commands there were two types there were the hash include which is just like a regular include that you see in PHP and there's also the hash execute exec command where it would actually execute something like some code it was the early days of doing something like PHP or JSP for Apache before we even had those things before even we saw anything like cold fusion or anything like that back in the day or ASP or any of those technologies we had server-side includes and the way that you knew it was first you configured it in Apache. You couldn't just throw an shtml file. You had to go into the config for your Apache server and enable server-side includes. And then Apache knew to process the document as a server-side include by the extension name. Again, controlled by the configuration, but that was the standard at the day. If you wanted Apache to process that file, you called it a .shtml. Knowing that, we might be able to trick out the system to actually try and include some shtml file or uh, calls in our system and as i said they look a lot like well you can see my examples right there they look a lot like commands but the syntax is really quite important all right exec is the execute command so a hash exec sorry and then with the execute uh, directive you would specify a parameter in this case it is the command and we're going to do something like this and then of course you end it as if it was a regular um, as if it was a regular comment in HTML okay so that's going to be our injection oh and if you're struggling with it you should be able to see it on the second last page Okay, um, mission eight is at the bottom of page four of the handout. And this is what we're looking at right now. Okay, so if you're struggling, refer to the lecture notes and you will see exactly what these are. I don't expect you to become proficient server-side include programmers, okay? It does, as we saw, this has been around for a long time. So this does really date this part of the website, no question. However, you will still find shtml files out in the wild. I checked a year ago now, and I still you can still find files out there that are .shtml. Are they all open to this vulnerability? Please remember what I said. You have to configure Apache, and not only do you have to configure Apache, you have to configure it to allow it to do the executable, because even back then they recognized the threat. So just enabling SSI isn't enough. You have to go into it and say, also allow executables as well. So it's a two-step before you can realize this vulnerability. All right. Once we try, and this is the last step, we're actually trying to inject some code into our environment. So now that we've got this SSI, let's click on Submit. And it says, your file has been saved. Please click here to view your file. 
And at that point where it says my name, right there, it actually executes that command injection where it does an ls of that temp directory. Okay. And of course, it's just all the shtml files. That doesn't really help us at all. But that gives us something to work towards. First off, we know we were right in our assessment. It is a server-side include. And second, it's been configured to allow the execute command as we had suspected. And it's allowing us to do, at this point, system calls in Unix, in this case, in Linux. Perfect. Let's try modifying our injection. We're in the temp directory. We want to see the 8 directory. All right. <clears throat> this is what's going on. The website is set up like this. Missions. All right. And then under missions, we have basic. And then in that, we have eight. And then inside that, we have temp. So this is the directory structure of our activity. We were able to do an ls in temp. We really want to do an ls of this directory here to see what's going on inside this directory. I did this on purpose because this is going to become very relevant with our next mission. All right. So we've got this directory. We want to do a directory listing of this directory. So we're going to change our injection from and this is why having, this is something to keep in mind, by the way, have a text editor open along the side so that you can quickly try stuff, copy and paste, and you will see shortly that it becomes very problematic in these small text fields to type in everything you want and see it properly. All right. What's easier is to actually have some text editor so that you can manipulate what your injection is going to be. We'll really see this when we take a look at DVWA in a few weeks, where you actually want some kind of text editor so you can craft your injection and then just copy and paste it into the browser. So I've done a directory of t listing of temp. I want to do a directory listing of eight. So I'm going to use ls dot dot. I'm going to make that my injection. Copy, paste it, and submit. Again, my file has been saved. Again, let's view it. And now we've got this as a directory listing, including our temp directory, so we knew it worked. <clears throat> and we've got those as well. An index file, a level 8 file, and a file called au12ha39vc.php. You know I want to take a look at that. Highlight that file name. Copy. Get rid of the file name up here. Get rid of the temp directory up here and paste that file name and hit enter. And again, we see our plain text password string. Copy it. Back button, back button, back button. Try it. And of course, it works. Any questions? Did everybody get that to work? Yep. If you had any problems, let me know. This is important to get this one working, and this is the reason why these two are my favorite. Number Mission 8 and Mission 9 are my favorite on this website, and you'll see why in a second. Okay. I like this. It's real world in that we've allowed a system call to occur and it's introduced a vulnerability into our website. It's a very real world example, even though it's using very legacy technology and very legacy um, stuff we really don't see anymore. Um, programming environments, if you will. It's not really a programming environment. It's a very old school way of adding dynamic content to an otherwise static website. Um, and I hate to say this, but I used to code in SSI all the time. That, that's how old, that's how long I've been doing website development, is I can remember developing websites using SSI back in the day. All right, let's take a look at Mission 9. And this is why I like Mission 8 and Mission 9. If you take a look at the source code here and scroll down, you're not going to find anything. 
I don't have an iPhone. Why you... Man, sometimes it sucks to live in an apartment building. Um, if I take a look at the source code, there's nothing. If I try submitting empty, there's nothing there. If I try, you know, injections, if I were to try doing an SQL injection, um, which looks like this. No, it didn't work. Um, tick or one is equal to one hash. If I try doing an SQL injection like that, it doesn't work. All right, we've got nothing we can do on this web page. But the reason why I like these is that we've already got a pinhole into our website. We don't have anything on this web page, but we know there's a compromise on this website. And that's the problem with hacking. I don't need to compromise every single page on this website. I need one pinprick in your defenses. And if it's the right one, I can now gain access to the entirety of your website. You have to be right all the time when you're doing web security. You screw up once and you leave a chink in the armor that people might actually be able to worm their way into your website. You have to be right every single time. Because that's impossible, you have to have layers to your defense so that if they do find that chink, the consequences are less as we saw earlier when we were talking about the types of breaches earlier this week. We have nothing to do here. However, we know basic mission eight already allows us into our website. So let's take a look at our directory structure again. This is what we've seen so far. We're in mission nine, okay? I wanna do a directory listing here, but I know that I can create a file in this directory that'll do a directory listing. So I'm gonna to have to modify my injection so it goes up to here, and then up to basic, and then into directory or folder nine. So I have to figure out a command injection in my SSI that will give me that kind of directory tra traversal and a directory listing of directory nine. So when I take a look at my injection here, I want to go, this is temp, I want to go above temp, I want to go above eight, and I want it, which takes me into basic, and, and then I want to go into directory nine, okay? When the SSI gets created, it gets created in this directory. We want to do a listing. If we just do an LS, we get this directory. If we do an LS of dot dot, we get this directory. If we do an LS of dot dot, dot dot, we get basic, and then we can transverse over to directory nine. By making this our SSI command, our command injection, we might be able to see the contents of directory nine. Now that we have crafted our injection, highlighting copy, in mission eight, paste that to create the server side include, click to view the server side include, and it is telling me that in directory nine, we've got those two files, including that file right there. P91E283ZC3.php. Your file name is probably different. Back button, back button, back button, back button. Oops, I'm into mission seven. If I get lost in my directory structure, you know what, that's fine. Select basic missions go down to basic mission nine and try that pass. Oh, no, open up that file. Oops, I didn't copy the file name. Blast in damnation. I'm gonna have to do that again. Why didn't I copy that? Okay, well, let's go to basic mission eight. Try that again. View the file. Let's copy the file name this time go into basic mission nine into that file and we see our string. Now, if you're worried, you can always hit the back button. I'm gonna highlight that before I lose that string. And again, we have something that looks like an unencrypted password string. Back button, back button. If you get lost in your document structure, 
just go back to the home page, select basic missions, and then scroll down to basic mission nine. Once you have the password string captured, paste it and submit it and it should work. Any questions on that? Did everybody get that? Yeah, that yeah. That's why I really like missions eight and nine is because that's the very real world problem that you face as an information security professional. Trying to mitigate against these, you have to be it's impossible, but your goal is to be as perfect as possible on every single page, on every single part of your website, because one pinprick opens up the entirety of your website. Now, as I said, this um, is contrived. All of this content is generated dynamically. It is not static content, so it analyzes your results. Variations on these commands that would work in another environment don't work here because this site is under attack all the time, so they don't actually run the SSI. They analyze your injection to make sure that it looks right enough. So it's kind of those online auto-correcting exams that check your code. Those are never perfect, and that's kind of what's going on here. So there's a little finicky from time to time. But if you do it as expected, it'll probably work. The syntax for an SSI, though, in general, is a very unforgiving thing. It has to be less than sign, bang, dash, dash, hash, and then either include or exec with no spaces. If you put a space there, it's not going to work. So you have to use the very unforgiving and exact syntax for these SSIs, for these server side includes. Any questions? That's the only place where Mission 8 helps on the rest of the site. When we take a look at Mission 10, again, control U, we don't get anything in our source code. If we were to take a look at um, trying a bunch of dummy data and what have you, we don't have any luck. Um, we could try taking a look at the DOM as well. And when we do that, again, we don't really see anything in our form, no hidden form elements or anything like that. But as was asked earlier, we can always try taking a look at the cookies and see if there's anything we can manipulate with the cookies. Now, when it comes to manipulating cookies, you can again do this in the developer tools in this DOM manipulator. In the top here, there's an option to go to storage. The shortcut key is Shift F9, but this is how I get here all the time. I go to the DOM. I click on storage and then I can start messing around with the cookies. Now does anybody see anything interesting in the cookies that we might be able to manipulate? Level 10 authorized, the value is set to no. Could it be that easy? Can we change the value to yes and see what happens? So we've changed our cookie. What happens if we submit with whatever? Boom. And we're in. And that is again an example of a real world vulnerability, in my opinion. Because people don't really understand session management, they often leave themselves open to this kind of a vulnerability. Alrighty? Any questions on any of that? Does that make sense? Okay. Perfect. I have to do that because I have section one after you guys, so I have to reset my cookie because I always forget and then my thing is always set wrong. So I did that for that reason. Now you can go take a look. You can even see basic 10 doesn't link to basic 11. And that's not me. That's You should all see the same thing. If you want to take a look at mission 11, you can take a look at mission 11. Um, it's long and tedious and difficult and it's a little whatever. Um, take a look at it if you want. I'll give you a clue. The answer is Elton John. Um, the point I think that they're trying to do with basic mission 11 is to get you to re or try and reinforce the try and see what you get. Try and see what you get. Find something. Pivot on it. Try. Um, they give you a clue here about it being a music site. Um, so you can try and play with it. I don't know. I don't like it. I found it very frustrating. It's not even part of, like, once you do basic mission 10, they don't even link to mission 11. So I think that speaks more than anything else to it. But regardless, if you want to 
by all means take a look at it again the clues John Elton John um, if you want to play more on this site there are some realistic missions you can take a look at and there are some JavaScript missions you can take a look at as well all right I'm not a fan of JavaScript so I don't spend a lot of time looking at that <clears throat> sorry excuse me but if you want to by all means take a look that's it for me for today I'm going to stop these recordings